All right, so we can start by going over the warm up. Uh, let me share that. Um, so this was looking at the um, vessels and the blood that we were covering last class. So arteries, so, so this is the arteries versus veins. So if we look at the walls, everybody got the walls of arteries are thicker. And again, why is it important that the walls of the artery are thicker than veins? Because of the resistance that, uh, that the walls are going to have when uh, diastole. No. Because the pressure is higher? Yeah, because the, the okay. blood pressure on the arterial side is always much higher. So it takes more smooth muscle in the wall to be able to hold and adjust the diameter there. Um, the veins are under very low pressure, so they don't need so much smooth muscle to adjust their, their diameter. Um, this one, a lot of people got this wrong. It says the arteries carry blood that is, you know, it can be oxygenated or deoxygenated, right? If you're on the pulmonary circuit, the arteries are taking deoxygenated blood out to the lungs. You know, because the direction, if you look at the direction, most people, not everybody, most people know that arteries are always leaving the heart. Um, but if you're leaving the heart from the systemic side, it's oxygenated blood. But if you're leaving the heart on the pulmonary side, it's deoxygenated blood. So make sure you don't get that confused. Um, again, I think people always get this idea, arteries are red, but you know, pulmonary arteries are blue. Pulmonary veins are red. You're carrying blood back from the lungs that's oxygenated. Hemoglobin that's bound, fully bound to oxygen is bright red. So um, there is a net loss. <laughs> All right, most people got, there's about a three liters per day of fluid that leaks out of your capillary beds. And how is that recovered and returned back so your blood doesn't turn into mud? Lymphatic system? Yes, the lymphatic capillaries collect it all, filter it through the lymph nodes and ultimately dump it back into the veins. Um, yeah, 30 liters a day, that would be a lot. Um, choose all that are true about red blood cells. Um, they have no nucleus. Most people got that. Bind and transport CO2. So most people got it, but not everybody. This is going to be important today, actually, when we talk about the ways that carbon dioxide is transported through your blood. About 30% of the carbon dioxide is being transported by being bound onto hemoglobin. Hemoglobin has a binding site for carbon dioxide. It's, it's not on that heme group. It's not on the, the iron containing part. It's on the globin um, protein subunit. Uh, but that's actually going to be important. And we'll also see the amount of carbon dioxide bound to the hemoglobin is actually going to affect hemoglobin's affinity for oxygen. So when we get to the details of how the blood delivers oxygen into the tissues, um, the amount of oxygen that is released or is held onto the hemoglobin is gonna actually depend on the amount of carbon dioxide. So that's gonna actually be important as we continue on today. Um, they are not part of your immune system. Those are the white blood cells that we'll look at in more detail when we do the immune system. Um, they do not bind and transport the hydrophobic molecules. Those are like the globins. We talked about the the globulins, I should say, the alpha globulins, the beta globulins, and other specialized um, transport proteins um, that bind and move things or things through the blood. Everybody got that they bind oxygen, and again, only live a few months because of no nucleus, um, and they're recycled. We talked about they're recycled. Where are they recycled? Where are the red blood cells recycled? 
The spleen. The spleen is one place. There's another place. Liver. The liver. Um, I didn't talk about it in, I don't know if I did talk about it. Part of recycling the red blood cells, um, your body holds on to the iron. In fact, iron is something that is kind of very tightly held by your body. It's part of the reason why it's, you have to be really careful with iron supplements if you have little kids around. Like kids can actually get poisoned from eating like iron supplement tablets because the body doesn't want to just let go of it. Um, right? If you eat a lot of vitamin C, you just pee it out. But if you eat way too much iron, you can get to toxic levels in your body. Um, another thing that's you know, fun fact about recycling red blood cells. Um, part of that recycling of the heme group is making um, this stuff called bilirubin, um, which ultimately ends up getting dumped in to be part of your bile and is what makes your poop brown. Um, so we'll, we'll talk, depending, I think we'll have a little time. We'll probably talk about um, hepatitis at some point. And hepatitis, um, that bilirubin, rather than going into the normal path and making your poop brown, gets kind of spilled into your bloodstream and you end up having just turning yellow and yellow eyes and yellow skin. And, and your poop actually ends up looking kind of like clay because it's kind of typically it's more of a gray color if you don't add that in. Um, Fenestrated, everybody got that. Um, and the spleen. So spleen does not filter lymph. Spleen filters blood. F spleen is, like when I think about it, it's kind of like a lymph node, but instead of filtering lymph, it's actually filtering your blood. It's got the same white blood cells in there, the lymphocytes and the macrophages that make up the lymphoid tissue, but it's used to filter your blood. Um, so that is a that. Um, so we're going to do today, just like just a few last things to talk about to tie off the blood and finally be done with cardiovascular. Um, and then we're going to just dive in and kind of tear through the respiratory system. So Let's start though by finishing up cardiovascular, by finishing up a few last points about the blood. So, finishing up blood. Um, and again, we're going to come back to the white blood cells when we do the immune system. We're not going to be done with all the blood because the lymphocytes, the macrophages, the basophils, the eosinophils, the monocytes, those are things that are going to come back in the immune system. But for right now, let's talk about hemostasis. So hemo, blood stasis stopping. This is what keeps blood from leaking out of your closed vascular system when you are, there's a rip in the wall of the blood vessel. And again, it can happen from a more dramatic thing, but it also happens just these things are delicate, they rip, it's happening all the time. Um, we've been introduced to the idea in our lab when we looked at blood clotting and fibrin and stuff, but there's more going on. It's more complicated than that. So we're going to put that blood clotting in a larger context of all the things that happen when there's a tear in the blood vessel that keep the blood from leaking out and also lead to healing of the blood vessel as well. So if I look at a blood vessel, you know, blood pouring through, what lines any all blood vessels and heart chambers for that matter? Endothelium. So this is all lined with endothelium, which is just simple squamous epithelium. 
We also said it's known as the tunica intima. So as long as the blood is just exposed, if that's all it sees, um, everything's cool. If there is some rip in the blood vessel, then you end up seeing kind of behind the walls. You get to see the stuff that's more structural. Um, you know, and one of the main structural proteins in your connective tissue is collagen. You know, collagen is what it's, let me think about leather. Leather is collagen mainly. It's just the, the collagen fibers in the dermis of the skin. Um, in anatomy, I'm sure you learned lots about collagen. Um, so collagen is gonna be the sign that something is wrong. It'd be, it'd be like if you walked into a room and instead of just seeing like the sheetrock and the wallpaper and stuff, all of a sudden you saw two by fours and conduits and stuff. It's like, whoa, I shouldn't be seeing that. There must be a hole ripped in the wall because those are things that make up the kind of structural things behind the wall. I shouldn't see that. So collagen is gonna be the trigger um, and it's gonna be the trigger for the platelets. So this whole hemostasis this kind of, you know, is triggered on the platelets, which we've talked about as the little formed elements that are part of your blood are exposed to collagen. And again, so if, if a platelet sees collagen, that's bad. It means there's got to be some rip in the wall here. Normally, all they should see is this endothelium. Um, platelets are kind of weird little things. Platelets are not really cells. They're more like little pinched off packets of granules of stuff. Um, I didn't talk too much about hemostasis. I should just, not hemostasis. Um, um, blood formation. So, um, so where is where is blood made? Bone marrow. So blood formation is made mainly in the marrow, um, in what we call the red marrow. Red marrow is inside kind of all your bones when you're a little kid. But as an adult, it's mainly in kind of flat bones, like in your skull and your sternum and your vertebrae and your hip bones, proximal ends of like your humerus and your femur. Um, the official word for blood formation is hematopoiesis. So we call these like hematopoietic tissues. Um, the platelets are made by these things called megakaryocytes. And they basically pinch off little packets that have granules of lots of things. And we're gonna talk about the kind of things that they have in just a few moments. But the big megakaryocyte, this is in the marrow, and then it makes these little packets that are now part of your bloodstream that are the platelets. And the platelets are going to be the major players in hemostasis. So let's talk about hemostasis. So the first thing that happens, the platelets will, when they're exposed to collagen, like I said, that's what triggers this. They are gonna go platelets. They actually release serotonin. Um, 
you know, usually think of serotonin more modern as kind of this neurotransmitter in your brain, but it was first seen here actually as part of um, hemostasis. Serotonin causes vascular spasms. meaning it makes the vessels constrict. You know, why is this gonna be a useful thing? And I'm gonna say like number one, you know, this is one of the first thing that happens when the platelets are exposed to collagen, releasing the serotonin, which causes vascular spasms. Why is that a good thing if all of a sudden you've got a rip in your blood vessel? To, re to reduce blood flow? Totally, exactly reduces blood flow to the region. There's a hole in the wall. So let's reduce the flow into the region so we don't have as much leaking out there. Um, the next thing the platelets do is they get kind of spiky um, and they start sticking together. In fact, let me, if I, let me kind of draw, let's say this is my, my um, vessel that now has a, a breach in the wall, the platelets will get kind of spiky and sticky and they'll start kind of dogpiling, sandbagging. This is gonna be part two. We're gonna get what's called the platelet plug. So again, this is another thing. Again, it's like if there's some leak, you throw a bunch of sandbags to kind of keep stuff from leaking out of the hole. Um, they're also releasing more signals, ADP and stuff that attracts more platelets. So not only does the platelets nearby start doing this, they send out signals that call in more platelets to add into the dog pile and to this platelet plug. So that's part two. First, we have these vascular spasms, which are reducing flow. Then the platelets are doing this platelet plug, this little dog pile of little sticky, spiky platelets to keep stuff from leaking out. And so this is before any of the coagulation, which we saw in lab. But the next part is going to be um, the clot formation, which is the stuff we actually did see in lab. So let's look at step three now. So the platelets release other stuff that is gonna start a whole cascade of events. There are a whole lot of different, um, different um, blood proteins that are involved in clot formation. Um, we are not gonna go into all of them. So there's gonna be like over 20, um, 20 um, proteins involved. Um, the last steps, I'll mention those. There's prothrombin and fibrinogen are, these are plasma proteins. So in the last steps of this clot formation and all these 20 different proteins activating each other, prothrombin becomes thrombin. And thrombin catalyzes the conversion of fibrinogen into fibrin. Which is that little stringy thing that you saw in the, when you broke the test, the little capillary tube. So this fibrin, so fibrinogen is, is soluble. This just stays dissolved in your plasma. It's not doing anything. But when you start this whole big cascade of activating these proteins and of ultimately prothrombin becomes thrombin, thrombin converts fibrinogen into fibrin. Fibrin is kind of like a Band-Aid. So again, I've got my my vessel here, I had my platelet plug, but now the fibrin, maybe I'll make it, I don't know, make it yellow 
the fibrin, that fibrous protein kind of papers over the, the break. and seals it off. Um, again, this can happen just initiated by a platelet being exposed to collagen. Um, there is a shortcut involved in making fibrin. Um, there's, a, there's actually a factor within the connective tissue that can speed up the process. Um, so you can have clot formation purely from an activated platelet, but then you can also speed it up using this tissue factor that comes from the connective tissue. But the basic idea is the fibrin is kind of a Band-Aid. So at this point, we've got a temporary fix, but obviously, you know, you're gonna wanna kind of heal things up. So, so this would be like step three, like I said, step three. So we started, you know, step one was this hemostasis. We just kind of started, well, step one. Step one was the vascular spasms. Step two was the platelet plug. Step three, now we have this fibrin, which we call it the clot. Um, the next steps are gonna be about kind of healing and repairing. So, You know, step four will be what we call like clot retraction and repair. Um, in clot retraction, there's actually contractile proteins that kind of pull things together, kind of squeeze the fluid out of the clot. Um, and we have what's called PDGF, platelet derived growth factor. You know, basically, you know, heal the connective tissue and epithelial tissue. So, you know, it's what it sounds like, growth factor. It helps um, promote the growth and healing of the actual vessel. Um, and then finally, once the vessel is healed, then you no longer need that Band-Aid on there, right? After you're, if you've had a cut, um, once the cut's finally healed, it's kind of silly to keep a Band-Aid on there. So the very final part is going to be um, dissolving the clot. I think, what do they call it? Fibrinolysis. Basically dissolve that fibrin this is done by um, plasmin. This is another one of these things. There's a tissue, a, a protein in your plasma called plasminogen. And this is just another plasma protein. Plasminogen becomes plasmin, and then plasmin is gonna come in and dissolve the clot, dissolves the fibrin. And then we're all good, we're back. We're back to a healed vessel and everything's all back to normal. Um, are there any questions about those different steps? Professor, one question. All the precursors, uh, plasminogen and fibrinogen are soluble? Yes. So okay. those, are, those are just plasma proteins that are always there kind of waiting for okay. this whole thing to start. Okay, perfect. Um, we can talk about a few of the things that can go wrong. Um, if I have some blood vessel and I have some clot forming that shouldn't, it just formed for kind of aberrantly, I call that a thrombus. 
So a thrombus is a bad thing because if it breaks free, it can then go and block things, right? So thrombus, a thrombus, if it breaks free, becomes an embolus. Embolus is once it's kind of on the move. And it might be on the move all right through the wider vessels, but eventually it's gonna to get to some smaller and smaller one and block the flow. That's like, a, that's what we call an embolism. Where that clot is stuck there. You know, that's how you get strokes, right? That could be a stroke if that's going into vessels that are serving your brain or you can get pulmonary embolisms. You can get, it could be a heart attack. It can be lots of things. Um, that's why people who are at increased risk for this are usually taking drugs that are anticoagulants, taking, you know, small doses of aspirin every day or Coumadin or different, you know, we talked about how these drugs that we call, you know, we call them blood thinners, but I'm putting it in quotes because it's not really a blood thinner, it's actually an anticoagulant. It inhibits this, this whole formation of the clot and therefore reduces the chance of having some thrombus that becomes some embolism like this. Um, other things that can go wrong with this is if you have um, hemophilia. Hemophilia is kind of the opposite problem is if you're not making the clot when you should. Um, you know, and that can come from lots of different reasons. That can actually be a genetic thing. If you have some genetic um, problem where you're not making one of these proteins involved in clot formation, then you are not going to be able to do this process properly. So, you know, hemophilia comes from these genetic um, genetic problems where you aren't making the protein properly. Um, you can also have problems you need like vitamin K to make all these proteins so you can actually get, have problems with blood clotting from malnutrition. Um, so there's that. The last kind of pathological condition I should probably mention is anemia. Anemia is when you are not delivering enough oxygen to your tissues. And this can happen for a bunch of reasons. What are ways you can end up getting anemia? Iron deficiency. Yeah, you can have iron deficiency. If you don't have enough iron, you don't make the hemoglobin and hemoglobin is necessary to carry the oxygen. So you can have iron deficiency anemia. You can also have hemorrhagic anemia. If you've just been bleeding a bunch, you don't have enough blood to, I'm gonna say spelling, I don't remember the spelling exactly. Um, you can uh, have- shape. A sickle cell, the shape of red blood cells. Sickle cell anemia. This is a condition, it's another genetic condition where you are off by one base pair on the DNA code to make hemoglobin, but that's enough to make the hemoglobin um, stick to itself in weird ways, particularly under low oxygen conditions. And the red blood cell, instead of looking like a regular red blood cell, folds in on itself, it gets what we call sickled. And then it makes it hard for it to go through the capillaries and take the oxygen where it needs to go. So you can get sickle cell anemia. You can have what's called aplastic anemia. This is if you have a problem with hematopoiesis, particularly like if you're having um, radiation treatment for cancer. Um, radiation, you know, it's going to actually affect the hematopoietic cells that are making your blood cells, and you are going to have 
you know, trouble having enough blood to carry things around. So there's lots of different ways you can get, you can get pernicious anemia. Um, this is a vitamin deficiency, like B12, B12 deficiency. B12, which is necessary to kind of make your blood cells properly. So there's lots of different ways to get anemia. You can not get enough oxygen, iron, or you can be bleeding out, or you can have these genetic issues, um, vitamin deficiencies, lots of different reasons. Um, so anyway, that's anemia. Um, I think we're done with the cardiovascular system. Um, are there any questions about anything in here before we shift gears into a new system? I have a question about one of the labs. Should I wait till later? Let's, let's do that during lab because we have a lot to cover here and we'll, we, we can cover lab during lab. Okay. All right, so. Peace and see you later. And we are now going to go and introduce the respiratory system. Um, it's worth just talking about the main functions of the respiratory system before we dig in. Um, what does it do for you? Oxygenates blood. Uh -huh. So this is gonna you know, bring O2 in expelled CO2. CO2 out. So we're going to look at that in a lot of detail, how you get the oxygen down near the blood. We're going to talk about the details of how the oxygen is then transported around and released into the tissues. So we'll be looking at that. And that's going to be kind of the main focus. But there's a couple of other things that we should mention just because they're important as well. What are other functions? Of the re repertory. What did I write here? Respiratory system. Um, one of the thing I'm doing right now, I mean, it's vocalization is actually important. You know, talking involves using your using your airflow, vibrating your little vocal cords to make sounds. Um, pH balance. Your respiratory system is going to be one of the major players actually in pH homeostasis. Um, by changing the amount of carbon dioxide in your body, you change the amount of carbonic acid, which changes the pH. So we're going to talk about that in more detail as well. We'll talk about how by changing the depth of your um, pulmonary ventilation, you can actually bring your pH up or down by like up, up 0.2 pH units or so. Um, but we're gonna focus primarily today on this. So let's look at that in more detail now. Um, there are gonna be a few main steps pulmonary ventilation. That's actually, you know, the oxygen is out in the room and you need to get it down into your lungs where it can actually enter into the bloodstream. So that's what pulmonary ventilation is. It's that, the bellows, 
getting the air down, getting the stale air out. Um, we'll look at that, like what actually happens there. It's going to be involving, you know, volumes and pressures and movement of air along pressure gradients. Um, so that's the first step is just getting the air down into the lung tissue where it can, the oxygen can then enter into the blood. Um, the next part we call external respiration. This is like where O2 enters blood. So we're going to talk about this. We'll talk about what is involved with um, the blood actually picking up the oxygen. You know, and then the, the next part that happens is like transport. Yeah, I could call it three if I wanted. This is the cardiovascular system, right? So once the oxygen is picked up by the blood, it's now gonna get distributed everywhere. But then we have what's called internal respiration. And here O2 leaves blood into the tissues. You know, we're, we're going to talk about this a bit because actually the delivery of oxygen into the tissues is going to be modified by the body's needs and the conditions in the tissue. It's going to be related to what I was talking about, like hemoglobin's affinity for oxygen being modified by levels of CO2. So it's going to be a little more complicated than just, you know, diffusion of oxygen. It's actually going to be uh, modified and modulated by the body's needs. Um, and then five, I would say, you know, once the oxygen is in the tissue, you know, like, why do we have to do all this? It's does because your cells need oxygen to do cellular respiration. But we're going to focus on right now is, you know, one, we're going to look at this pulmonary ventilation in more detail. We're going to look at this part in detail. We're going to look at this part in more detail. So that's that's kind of our our um, plan because we've already talked about transport out the wazoo as well as cellular respiration. This part you should feel pretty comfortable with. All right, um, we need to do a little bit of the basic um, anatomy. Um, so that's probably easier if I use a, use a picture. So I'm gonna do that here, share screen. All right, so this is just from your book. This is the picture of the respiratory system. Um, whoop. I'm gonna get my pen. Let's get a different color. Let's make it purple. All right, so the nasal cavity. This is where, you know, and you normally breathe through your nose. You can obviously mouth breathe. Both the nasal cavity and your oral cavity meet up together in the back of the throat here. So, you know, whether or not the air is coming in through your mouth or in through your nose, it's ultimately going down the same place down into your lungs. Um, what are the benefits of breathing in through your nose? It warms the air. So one is it warms the air. You know, if you think about it, the lung tissue is really delicate. It's actually, when we get to the lung tissue, it's this very, um, the most delicate tissue you can get, simple squamous epithelium. So you wanna actually precondition the air before it gets down there. So you can warm the air, it humidifies the air. 
And then one other major thing it does. It filters it? Yeah, filters. Um, let's talk about the filtering. Um, there's a variety of things that your respiratory does to keep dust and other stuff from making it down into the delicate little lung tissues down into the ultimate the little alveoli where gas exchange is happening. So I, I should actually probably do this. So you've got your nasal cavity, you've got your oral cavity, they're kind of meeting back here. And ultimately, going down towards the lungs. So first thing I'm sure most of you have seen, you have what we call the vibrissae. That's like the fancy word for nose hairs. So if you've got like, you know, big things, you can, they get caught just in the nose hairs that are kind of lining. We call these the external nares, kind of your, the little tubes going up into your nose there, into the nasal cavity. Um, but then the lining of all of your respiratory passages, whether it's the nasal cavity here, or whether it's going down into the trachea, this is like going, this is the trachea, going down to the lungs. Both the nasal cavity up here, and then the lower, so this is kind of our upper respiratory passages, what we call. This is gonna be like lower respiratory. They are all lined with this respiratory epithelium, which again, if you've been in anatomy, you remember. What is the official word for the respiratory epithelium that's lining all of these spaces? It is stratified squamous. It's, it's that pseudostratified columnar um, with goblet cells and it's ciliated. So there's little cilia that go back and forth. There are these goblet cells that are making mucus. Um, and there's actually big mucus glands underneath as well. So there's mucus on top. There's little cilia that are constantly in motion, sweeping the, um, sweeping the mucus along. So mucus, sticky mucus lining again, all of these spaces. Whoop, whoop. Sticky mucus up in here, sticky mucus down in the lower parts. And it's kind of like flypaper. Um, really, even down to really small little particles will get stuck in the mucus. Um, and there's also, there's what we call the conchi. Should probably mention those. The nasal conchi are basically ridges. Like if you look inside your nasal cavity, it's got all of these big shells and baffles. So when you breathe in, the air is getting all swirled around. So if you're some little dust moat, you're swirling around, you're probably gonna hit the wall and get stuck in the mucus. Um, and then, actually I need a, again, I should have drawn a bigger picture here. <laughs> 
And again, this mucus is, whoops. This mucus is up and covering, lining your upper respiratory passages. It's lining your lower respiratory passages and it's catching stuff. And the other tube we need to add in here, obviously what's the other thing that is connected uh, to your throat aside from your lungs and the trachea? Esophagus. Yeah, your esophagus. So that's, and we're going to talk about that later. Um, maybe I should add in the little epiglottis here. But basically what happens is those cilia sweep the mucus back to the throat, to the entrance to the esophagus. If it's in the upper respiratory passages, you're going to sweep the mucus downward. If you're in the lower ones, you're gonna sweep the mucus upward, but it basically is gonna gather here, the back of the throat, and then you swallow it. And it goes down to your stomach and hits the acid and it's out of, out of, out of your, like, if you think about it, even right now, like normally this is happening unconsciously, you're just swallowing every once in a while as the mucus builds up in the back of your throat. Um, now that I've just mentioned it, I bet you a lot of you are realizing, oh my God, I got to swallow. Um, it just happened to me. Um, whenever I get to this part in the lecture, I always realize, good grief, it happened again. I actually need to swallow. Normally, it's just happening unconsciously. The mucus is getting swept to the back of your throat where you swallow it and get it out. Um, other ways that you have to deal with dust, you have explosive air, air movements. Um, what is the explosive air movement to try to get things out of the upper respiratory passages? A sneeze. A sneeze. What's an explosive air movement to get things out of the lower respiratory passages? Coughing. Coughing. So sneezing and coughing, that's another way you have of clearing stuff out of there. Um, if things make it all the way down into the deepest reaches of the lungs, um, we have the alveolar macrophages down here. Macrophages, big eaters, are basically white blood cells or like amoebas that are on patrol eating stuff. So anything that makes it all the way down down into the very alveoli, they get gobbled up and taken away by these alveolar macrophages. Um, they're, they get a cute name. Their um, name is dust cells. You know, they're on patrol for dust. You know, so these are all these different ways you have of trying to get, you know, keep, keep stuff from getting down. You know, and, there's always stuff making it down there. Um, you know, we live in a world where it's full of cars and factories and this or that. You don't see it, but all those cars driving down the street are spewing all sorts of crap into the air. So even people who, you know, there's always those pictures of lungs where, you know, smokers lungs versus even if, if you just live in a city, your lungs are constantly dealing with soot and crap. And luckily these guys are on patrol and they're taking, taking it out and depositing it into like mediastinal lymph nodes and stuff. Um, but you're constantly um, having to deal with crap making it down in there. Um, what else? Let's talk a little bit about this junction between the esophagus and the um, and the um, trachea, because we need to look at that a little bit. Right, hold on, my picture got messed up. There we go. 
All right, so what I'm trying to illustrate here is the nasal cap, oops, nasal cavity. You know, the oral cavity. It's your mouth and your tongue. You know, they meet in the back, what we call the nasopharynx and then the oropharynx and the laryngopharynx. You know, we can just, just call it the pharynx. Pharynx is basically the fancy word for your throat. Um, but at that point, after we get past the pharynx, then we get to the junction where you can either go down to towards your stomach or go down towards your lungs. And that is gonna be this structure called the larynx. Is the entrance to the trachea. So the larynx is taking you down towards the, down towards the lungs. The esophagus is taking you down towards the stomach. Um, obviously, if you are swallowing food, you want it to go down towards the stomach. You don't want it to go down towards your lungs or else that's what we call choking. Um, so how do we make sure that um, when you're swallowing that the food doesn't go down into your lungs? The epiglottis. The epiglottis. There's a little flappy doodle thing right here. It's called the epiglottis. And it basically folds over when you're swallowing and blocks that entrance. So the food is gonna go down your esophagus rather than go down into your, into your trachea. Um, you can actually, if you touch like the larynx, the main cartilage of the larynx, you can feel the thyroid cartilage, you can feel as your Adam's apple. Um, if you touch your Adam's apple and swallow, in fact, I, everybody should just do that you'll feel the whole larynx ride up and then drop back down. As the larynx is riding up, it's helping pinch off that epiglottis to make sure that the entrance to the trachea is, is shut off when you do your swallowing. Um, other things about the larynx, the larynx is where we find the vocal cords. They're also called the vocal folds. Um, if I was looking, if, if, I, if we decapitated this person here and we looked straight down, it would look like this. And there's a little space in between. That space in between is gets the name the glottis. Which is why you can see epiglottis gets its name, right? Epiglottis. The epiglottis here is right above the glottis, the little space in between where the vocal cords are. And the vocal cords, they have two different ways they can be manipulated by your muscles. Um, you can, there's little, the arytenoid cartilage, as you probably remember from anatomy, you can open and close the glottis. You know, that is useful if you're um, trying to build up pressure in your, you know, if let's say I'm, I want to cough, I have to build up <clears throat> and then let it go. I close the glottis, build up pressure and open it. And that's a cough. Or if you're bearing down for a bowel movement, you close the glottis. So no air can move in or out along into the trachea. So 
You can adjust this glottis if you can block or open it up to allow airflow in and out of the trachea. The other thing you can do with the vocal cords is adjust the tension. You can make them more taut or less taut. And these vibrate. When you have air blowing up and down, they vibrate and they make a tone. You know that, ah. Uh, and depending on the tension, they'll vibrate at a higher or lower frequency. We've talked about this a bunch. Um, again, I can, you know, if, you know a, a string under high tension is a high pitch. A string under lower tension vibrates at a lower pitch, high or lower, you know, tight, loose. You know, and all of your, all your vocal cords do is make a buzz. Um, and they can go depending on how tight. I, that's, you can, you can adjust the tension by kind of rocking your, your larynx and stuff. Um, everything else that's part of your voice is actually um, what your mouth and your oral cavity and all of that is doing right? All your vocal cords do is make a buzz. Everything else is like your tongue and, you know, er, ah, ee, ow. I'm just changing, vowel sounds are just changing the resonant chamber in my mouth. E, ah, ow. You know, and p and f and fricatives and plosives. It's all stuff you're doing with your tongue and your mouth and your lips and all that. So when you think of your vocal cords, they don't actually like talk they just buzz um, it's the tongue and the mouth and the oral cavity and everything that gives you gives you um, your voice and you know all those chambers give it its particular timbre the, the, the reason you sound funny if your nose is all plugged up is because it's changing the resonant chamber in your um, kind of up in your nasal cavity, oral cavity. Um, so that's vocal cords. Um, yeah, you've, I mean, I'm sure you've probably seen those kind of those commercials meant to scare you out of smoking, where it's like they put a little vibrator on their throat. You know, I did not know when to stop smoking and now I don't have vocal cords and I must use a little buzzer to talk to you all. Don't make the same mistake that I have. You know, you've probably seen that. Um, anyway, that just kind of gives you a sense that all you need is a vibrating tone and your mouth and tongue does the rest. Um, all right. Let's now continue down. Oops. So another thing we need to talk about is the idea of keeping the airways patent. Um, this is the term people use for meaning kind of open. It looks like patent, but they say patent. Um, you know, your blood vessels stay open just because the blood inside has pressure to push open the push against the walls. But the air isn't going to be able to do that. So we need extra reinforcement to keep your airways open or else they'll collapse in on themselves. Um, you know, so, you know, there's going to be cartilage rings um, lining the trachea, lining the bronchi. Um, until you get to the very smallest, when we get to the very smallest bronchioles, then 
um, it's just smooth muscle and you no longer need cartilage to um, hold it open. But for the first parts, like the trachea and the larger air passages, the larger bronchi, you have these cartilage rings that help hold them open. Um, I should mention in the trachea, the cartilage rings aren't actually all the way around. Like if I do a cross section of your trachea, you know, the esophagus is right behind it. So the cartilage actually is more of a C shape. That way when you're swallowing your Thanksgiving turkey or whatever, it's not gonna whack against a cartilage ring there. You know, this is room for the esophagus to kind of expand on the back there. Uh, what else? Let's, um, let's now focus in on this respiratory tree. So here's my trachea. So now we're getting down into the chest cavity, the thoracic cavity. We're gonna talk about that in much more detail. They call it the respiratory tree because it starts branching like, you know, like an upside down tree. Um, we have what are called the primary bronchi. These are going to the right and the left sides of your of your chest. Um, secondary or lobar bronchi. Now you have actually only two lobes on the left side and three lobes on the right because of, um, because the heart takes up space on the left. The heart is like two thirds of the heart is on the left side of your chest cavity. So there's only actually two, two lobes on, on, of your lung on the left side. And then they just keep branching and branching into smaller and smaller little branches. I'm, I'm not gonna get into, there's the segmental bronchi and la la la. Um, there's gonna be ultimately 23 orders of branching. Um, when you get into the smaller ones, they're called bronchioles. Um, bronchioles no longer have cartilage. These just have smooth muscle in the walls. Um, and then at the very end, so all of this that I'm drawing here, this we call like the conducting zone. Because there's no gas exchange or anything that's happening yet. This is just about bringing the air down. The place where we actually have gas exchange is gonna be in the alveoli. what we call like the respiratory zone. You know, it says, you know, where gas exchange occurs. Um, we're gonna talk about these in much more detail in a few moments. Um, you have a lot of these. There's like somewhere around 300 million alveoli um, with a surface area the size of like a racquetball court. So there's a huge, a huge um, surface area for gas exchange. Obviously, there are going to be um, blood vessels that are 
coming in and capillaries so you can like pick up the oxygen. Um, so alveoli, this respiratory zone where gas exchange actually occurs, all this other part, the conduction zone or conducting zone. Um, we're gonna talk about this in more detail later, but like this is kind of this respiratory dead space. Like when you breathe in and breathe out, it's not like a total flushing of your lungs. When you breathe out, there's always gonna be stale air that's trapped in this conducting zone, as well as in kind of the alveoli that are not totally deflated. And then when you breathe in your, your new fresh air, it's gonna mix with some of the stale air that's already still hanging out in this conducting zone. So when we look at the partial pressure of oxygen in the room versus the partial pressure of oxygen down in the alveoli where the actual gas exchange occurs, it's gonna be lower partial pressure of oxygen in the alveoli. Um, you know, because you're always mixing your fresh air with some of the stale air that is always gonna be trapped in this conducting zone. Um, so that's gonna, you know, it's different. If you're a bird or something, you have much more efficient lungs. There's kind of a one-way trip through the, through the um, respiratory zone, the parabronchi and everything. We're not gonna talk about that because of time. Um, but it's gonna come up in a little bit when we talk about the oxygen available in the alveoli is gonna be a lower partial pressure than the oxygen available in the room because it's mixing with the stale air that's, that you, you never totally flush out. Uh, oh my gosh, let me think about what we should do here. Um, let's... Let's get a little more detail of the alveoli and of the actual movement of oxygen from the room into your, into your um, bloodstream. Are, this, um, are the ends of the bronchioles a part of the respiratory zone or are they still the conduction zone? So the conduction zone is just means the stuff that's carrying the air down. So the very end is what we call the terminal bronchial. The very end of all the branching of the tree, that's the end of this conducting zone. And that's now gonna lead us into the alveoli. Oh, gotcha, thank you. Um, I should mention the bronchioles, I mentioned how they have smooth muscle. Um, that smooth muscle is operated by you know, your, your um, autonomic nervous system, right? Parasympathetic will constrict it, um, sympathetic dilates it. And the flow of air is just the same as the flow of blood. If you dilate these bronchioles, less resistance, it's easier to bring the air in, you constrict it, more resistance, it's harder. Like, so if you inhale something noxious, you're gonna have a response where you're gonna constrict these bronchioles and you know, increase resistance and not pull so much of that noxious stuff down into your lungs. Um, if you have these bronchioles constricting just due to allergic reactions though, that's where you get asthma. Asthma is if that smooth muscle in the bronchioles is constricting and increasing resistance to flow. So then you have to work way harder to drive the movement, the flow of air in and out of your lung tissue. Um, you know, and asthma is not just about harder to breathe in, it's, it's, it's harder to breathe out as well. It's just harder to have flow through the respiratory tree. Um, so alveoli. You know, they're in these kind of big clusters. They talk about them like clusters of grapes. We call the alveolar sacs. Um, alveoli are made 
with the thinnest kind of tissue because we want to maximize diffusion of oxygen into the bloodstream. So it's simple squamous epithelium. And you've got little capillaries coming in with deoxygenated blood. And they're going to be picking up oxygen and getting to leave with oxygenated blood. So this is where the blood comes in deoxygenated and is going to leave with oxygen. Um, and it's happening just across, it's, it's literally, we talked about a capillary being simple squamous epithelium. The alveoli is made of simple squamous epithelium. If I think of a capillary, it's basically the thinnest kind of wall you can make using the building blocks of a human body. Simple squamous epithelium for the alveolus. Simple squamous epithelium, this is my little capillary. And it's gonna be kind of a minimum distance for the oxygen to diffuse from the alveoli into the bloodstream. And obviously we have our blood, blood cells in here. Um, the blood also slows down. Um, it spends at least, I think about a third of a second percolating there. So it's, there's plenty of time to um, have the diffusion and equalize the oxygen. Um, other cells that we find in here, there's also the alveolar macrophages I talked about, the dust cells. You know, we said those are important in case dust gets down in here. You know, they're just on patrol. They're just finding things that need to get cleaned up. And then again, white blood cells I talked about, they are, they're like little mercenaries. They just move in and out. They go here, they go there. They jump into lymphatics and travel around, go someplace else. Definitely think of macrophages as, as little independent. Even though they're kind of officially like you, they also, it's, it's not, that wrong to think of them as kind of semi-autonomous as well, kind of uh, doing their job to kind of keep you going. Um, and then the other cells that we find in here are surfactant cells, which we need to talk about. which makes surfactant. Surfactant is basically kind of like a detergent. Um, it basically breaks up water tension. So part of the problem here is water molecules have hydrogen bonds and they pull on each other. You know, we saw that in the first week of class. Um, and they pull on each other pretty hard. You know, if you've ever been at a lake or a pond and you can see the water skeeters walking on the water, and most people have probably seen like the little bugs, the little water skeeters. If you're, you know, at, so the water tension is actually strong enough that it's pulling and it's gonna actually make it hard to inflate the lungs. So we've got water, you know, kind of lining in here. And all of that water tension is working to collapse the alveoli. The water surface tension is working to collapse and make it hard to inflate the alveoli. Um, the surfactant 
breaks up the attractions between the water molecules. They basically, a detergent is something that has, you know, it's like a phospholipid. It's like a phospholipid, right? It has one side that's polar, one side that's nonpolar. So the polar side goes to the water, the nonpolar side doesn't attract to anything. So that basically disconnects the pull from one water molecule to the next. And this is gonna make it possible to in actually inflate your lungs because this will break up the water tension or the, the water surface tension, I should say. So these are critical. Um, if you don't have those, you can't inflate your lungs. Like a preemie is born, does not make, is not making surfactant yet. They have to actually, they spray surfactant into their respiratory system and they put them on little itty bitty ventilators to keep making sure the air comes in and out because it's really hard to inflate your lungs if you don't have surfactant. Um, I should mention there is kind of a natural tendency for lung tissue to want to kind of collapse in on itself, partly because of the surface tension of the water, also because there's elastic fibers in here. So this is actually important. Um, the elastic, elastic fibers as well as this surface tension give the lungs what we call compliance. So it's kind of this stretchiness. You, you kind of inflate them, but then if you let go of them, they're going to naturally want to kind of get smaller again. You know, when we talk about pulmonary ventilation in a bit, um, inhaling is very active. You've got to use muscles to inhale. But to exhale, pretty much, unless you're doing an active exhalation, like you basically just relax. If you relax, everything kind of gets smaller. We'll talk about that in more detail. Um, if you don't have this, like it can get compromised in diseases like, um, what do you call it, um, emphysema. That makes it actually a lot harder. You actually have to be more active in exhaling if you have emphysema because the lungs don't naturally just want to kind of get smaller. And you have to actually work to exhale as well as to inhale. Um, so lung compliance. Um, so let's um, continue talking about the alveoli. Let me draw an alveolus here. That's just single for alveoli. Um, you've got the capillary here. So the blood coming in. So this is blood returning from the tissues, right? So this is after delivering, delivering the oxygen. And then you pick up the oxygen and going off. So this is supposed to be like capillary here. Um, so let's talk about oxygen levels. Um, diffusion of oxygen is driven by diff like diffusion of anything, by concentrations. Um, the amount of gas, when we're talking about for gases, we're gonna be talking about the pressures. You know, gas will move from high to low, higher to lower pressure. Um, we do need to talk about Dalton's law of partial pressure. 
Um, so air, air in the room is made up of a bunch of different gases. What is, what's the main gas in the, just the air in the room? Nitrogen. It's nitrogen. It's like almost 80% nitrogen. Um, oxygen only makes up about 21% of the air. So 21% of atmosphere, atmospheric air is O2. So even though the air pressure, it, does anybody know what is, what is one atmosphere in terms of like millimeters of mercury or tor? You must remember from chemistry. What's the normal just pressure, standard temperature and pressure? Somebody? 760? Yeah, exactly. You do guys, you guys do know it. So this is basically one atmosphere of pressure at sea level here. This is like at sea level. And Dalton's law of partial pressure says that the pressure due to oxygen is going to be in direct proportion to the percentage that oxygen is part of the gas. So Dal Dalton's law of partial pressure is basically saying that the total pressure is contributed by each of the subparts of the overall gas mix, you know, according to what percentage that particular gas makes up the overall thing. So if oxygen is 21% of the air, then it's going to be contributing, its partial pressure is going to be 21% of the overall pressure. So the partial pressure of oxygen is going to be 21% times that which ends up being 159 millimeters of mercury. But as I was saying, when you breathe in, you're always mixing the fresh air with the stale air that's still lingering in those conducting zones or in the not totally deflated alveoli. So when we actually get into the alveolus, the partial pressure of oxygen is going to be more like 100. So PO2 is going to be, I'm going to, you know, in my notes, I have 104 millimeters of mercury. So this is the partial pressure of oxygen here in the alveoli when you have taken in an inhale about. So the other thing we need to think about is what's the partial pressure of oxygen in the blood? Because that's going to determine which way does the oxygen move. So when the blood is returning from the tissues, PO2 is around 40 millimeters of mercury. So we have 40 millimeters of mercury in the blood, 100 in the alveoli, which way is the oxygen going to move? To the capillary. It's going to move into the capillary get, and get picked up by the red blood cells. So by the time the blood is leaving, and again, it the blood spends, again, upwards of a second percolating here, and it equilibrates. So by the time it's leaving, the partial pressure of oxygen leaving here is going to be around 100 millimeters of mercury as it heads back to the left ventricle and out to the, out to the um, tissues. So this number is going to come back in a few moments. When we look, when we actually look at the other side, what's going on in the tissues, we're going to see the blood leaving the tissues is leaving at around 40 millimeters of mercury. So this is what drives the movement of oxygen from the alveoli into the lung, I mean, into the blood. Carbon dioxide goes the opposite. If we're looking at CO2, partial pressure of CO2 
is around 45 in the blood. Partial pressure of CO2 is about 40 in the um, alveoli. So CO2 is going to move the other way. CO2 is going to move from the blood into the alveoli to be exhaled. You know, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere overall is really low, but it builds up quite a bit inside your respiratory system because you're not flushing things out totally. Um, so this is this idea of this external respiration. This idea that you are taking oxygen, moving it into the blood along its pressure gradient, taking carbon dioxide, taking it out of the blood according to its pressure gradient. Um, it's worth noting that, again, the partial pressure of oxygen is a fraction of the atmospheric pressure. And this is at sea level. As you go up higher and higher, um, you know, what is air pressure? The, the atmospheric pressure is just all of the gas on top of you up into the top of the atmosphere, all of these molecules sitting on top of your head. So if you're on a tall mountain, if you're up in Lake Tahoe, there's less column of air sitting on your head. There's less overall air pressure, which means this number is lower. In fact, I, I went and I looked, let me find the actual numbers. You know, if you're up in Lake Tahoe, the atmospheric pressure is only 609 millimeters of mercury. If you were on Mount Whitney, um, it would only be 429 millimeters of mercury. You know, if I, if I, if I go like four, 429, 0.21 times, you know, that means like partial pressure of O2 on the top of Mount Whitney is only around 90 millimeters of mercury, much lower, which means even lower, and we talked about in the alveoli is even lower than that. But you get an idea of why it gets harder to breathe when you're up at altitude, because the higher you are, the less the air pressure is the less the air pressure is overall, the less the partial pressure of oxygen is. The less the partial pressure of oxygen is, the less you have driving the movement of oxygen from your lungs alveoli into your bloodstream. So th th does that make sense? Um, if you're on the top of Mount Everest, um, I did the calculation here, on the top of Mount Everest, the air pressure is down around 225 millimeters of mercury. It's actually not enough pressure to actually keep oxygen moving into your bloodstream. You actually need to use like an oxygen tank or something to stay alive if you're sitting on the top of Mount Everest. So just kind of putting that out there. The reason why you're kind of more out of breath at altitude is, you know, you have less of a pressure gradient to move the oxygen into your blood. You know, things your body can do to adjust to this. Um, I didn't talk about this, but your body can actually increase the number of red blood cells. So there's more red blood cells to carry oxygen around. Um, we call it erythropoiesis. There's a, there's a hormone released by your kidneys called erythropoietin that ups the production of red blood cells. Um, so if you're finding that you're having trouble, you know, carrying enough oxygen around, your body will actually adjust by increasing red blood cell production. Right? People will train at altitude um, because they're, if they're going to do a race, because they're going to end up having more red blood cells than they would have if they were training at sea level. Then when they come back to the race at sea level, they're supercharged. Some people even take erythropoietin as a performance enhancing drug because it will increase the amount of red blood cells in your body. Lance Armstrong did it. <laughs> Eddie yeah. Truff, yeah. I, I did a research, yeah. Okay, yeah, no, he, yeah, I was very disappointed by that dude, <laughs> I have to say. 
I, yeah, he went from really impressive to kind of a scumbag. Um, anyway, I, my opinion. Um, let's talk a few moments about the actual transport now. So we have this external respiration. We have the gas getting into the blood. Now we have to move it. Um, for O2, O2 is almost fully transported by hemoglobin. Oxygen really does not dissolve in water very well, um, which is going to be different. When we get to the um, carbon dioxide, it actually does dissolve pretty well. Um, so oxygen is easy. We're done. Um, we are going to talk a little more about it bound to hemoglobin when we get to the internal respiration. But for this transport, let's just say it's moving along hemoglobin. CO2 is more complicated. Um, some CO2 is actually bound to hemoglobin. So maybe, you know, 30% bound to hemoglobin. So it's a separate, separate binding site. So it's not binding to the heme group. So it's got a separate place to get, get picked up. Maybe 10% is just dissolved in the plasma. Um, if you've ever had soda water or Coke or 7-Up, it's not going to be shocking to you that carbon dioxide dissolves in water pretty easy. So carbon dioxide dissolves in water. So about 10% of the CO2 is just dissolved in your blood like soda, soda water. But that still leaves us with the lion's share, 60%. The main way it's being transported is as bicarbonate ion. Um, so, and this, this, this is going to be kind of familiar to you. We've talked about it in a few different contexts. So let's talk about this again. So CO2 is coming into your blood. CO2 plus H2O will become carbonic acid, HCO3. H2CO3, this is carbonic acid. Um, this is going to be um, catalyzed by an enzyme that the red blood cells have called carbonic anhydrase. So carbonic anhydrase is an enzyme in, from the RBCs. Um, and then what happens to carbonic acid once you make that? The fact that it's an acid, what does it do? Breaks down in the hydrogen ions. Yeah, it's going to dissociate into H plus plus HCO3 minus. Um, this HCO3 minus, this is the bicarbonate ion. Um, so this is now going to be the main way that it's moving around. Um, remember that little chloride um, bicarbonate um, exchanger? That's, that's, that's part of this whole process. You know, as you're making, um, as you're making this stuff, you, 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 you swap it out 
basically, how does this work? You, um, this, how, oh, now I'm spasm. This kind of comes in, breaks apart. Oh yeah, and then this leaves the cell and chloride comes in. So, um, but this is the basic idea. You're making this bicarbonate. Um, and then this is all in equilibrium. So when you have lots of carbon dioxide, you move this way and make more bicarbonate and transport things around. When you get into the lungs, where you're getting rid of the carbon dioxide, taking this away, that's gonna move the equilibrium this way and this is gonna re regroup into this. This is gonna break apart into this and the CO2 will, will leave. Um, so this is the basic way that the majority of your CO2 is transported. You are making bicarbonate to transport it um, taking the bicarbonate and moving it back into gaseous CO2 as, as it's removed. So, so carbon dioxide is got three different ways, 2A, 2B, and 2C, right? Whereas oxygen is just done by hemoglobin. Um, let's talk briefly, briefly about the external respiration and then we'll finish up with um, ventilation. All right, so the blood is coming in. We just talked about the blood leaving the leaving the um, the lungs and then getting delivered. The blood here is going to have a partial pressure of oxygen of around a hundred millimeters of mercury. Um, by the time it's leaving. It's going to be about 40 millimeters of mercury. So that's where it's a kind of, it's equilibrated. It's kind of given up oxygen until it's down to about this. And now it's heading back to the lungs. And so obviously what's happening in here is oxygen is leaving, letting go of the hemoglobin and going into the tissue. But how much of the oxygen actually leaves um, is going to depend on a variety of things. So what I'm going to talk about now is the process by which the hemoglobin lets go of the oxygen and how, how that's affected by conditions in the tissues. Um, and if, if you think about it, if your tissues are really metabolically active, you're gonna need more oxygen than you would otherwise. So there's gonna be a mechanism here to release more oxygen if, if you're really metabolically active in the region. So let's look at how this works. We're gonna talk about what's called the oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve. So this is going to be percent saturation with oxygen for hemoglobin. I'm writing it, let me write this prettier. So I'm going to write HB for hemoglobin. So what am I, what do I, what, oh, I did not, let me make sure I didn't spaz here. 
10, 20, 30, 40, or 50, 60, 70, 80, 90. Oh, this will be 100. So 100% here means that the hemoglobin in the blood has as much oxygen as possible. Every heme is bound to an oxygen, four oxygens per hemoglobin. 0% means there's no oxygen bound onto the hemoglobin. So this is basically percent oxygen of total possible bound to the hemoglobin. Um, my x-axis is going to be the partial pressure of oxygen in the tissues that it's going through. So let's now do this. So the, and we know the blood coming in, let's remember this. Remember that the blood coming into the tissue here is got a, a partial pressure of about a hundred millimeters of mercury. So if the tissues were also a hundred millimeters of mercury, how much oxygen would the blood give up? None. None. There would be no net movement of oxygen. If it was zero millimeters of mercury out here, how much do you think it would give up? All. All of it. So perfect. Exactly. So if we go here, if we are at 100 per millimeters of mercury in the tissue, the blood stays at 100% saturation. It doesn't give up any of its oxygen. If we're at zero millimeters of mercury, then the blood gives up all of its oxygen. There's zero oxygen left on the hemoglobin. But where this gets interesting, whereas you might think it's just like a line in between, it's not at all. It's very nonlinear, which is why we have to talk about this. So this point here, this 40, remember the 40 millimeters of mercury, that is where the blood is equilibrating with the tissues. Typically, this is supposed to be 75 here. When the blood is going through and equilibrating at 40 millimeters of mercury, it's still holding on to three fourths of the original oxygen that it held. Right, so what that means here, it means, you know, you've got this kind of story about, oh, the blood's picking up oxygen, delivering it and going back and getting more. But the reality is the blood's coming in you know, topped off totally with blood or with oxygen. Let's maybe, let me make this a, a, a pretty, uh, so the blood, little Joey blood drop is coming in completely filled with oxygen, equilibrating here at 40 millimeters of mercury. And now little Joey blood drop is going back to pick up more oxygen but is actually still holding on to 75% of the original oxygen that he came in with, you know, and just getting topped off basically, right? So when you are quote unquote, delivering the oxygen to the tissues, you're actually only giving up about one fourth of the oxygen that you were holding on to and you're returning to the lungs with still 75%, three quarters of the original load of oxygen. Um, so if we go back, 
to our picture here, we get this kind of nonlinear thing. It looks kind of like this. Where, again, coming back to, after you've equilibrated and you're coming back to the lungs, you still have 75% of your oxygen. But this curve can change depending on the conditions in the body. So if there are conditions that are part, that are, what kind of things are gonna be happening in the tissues if there is a lot of metabolic activity? You're running a lot of cellular respiration and stuff. The partial pressure of oxygen in the tissues will raise. Um, but you will be you will need more oxygen. But what kind of things? What what do you think? It's going to be more CO two. More CO two. So if you're mm. increase in CO two, um, other things that happen if there's a lot of metabolic activity, you know, there's a lot of waste heat. There's an increase in temperature. Um, if there's an increase in CO two. What happens to the pH, as we just saw? It goes down, more acidic, a decrease in pH. Um, or, and there's also this other thing, it's one of the intermediates in cellular respiration, in, in glycolysis called BPG, increase in BPG. This is just um, you know, from glycolysis. So any of these things are indications that there's increased metabolic activity in the tissue. And what happens is the hemoglobin has less affinity for the oxygen. It will let go of more oxygen under the same conditions. So now, maybe I'll do this yellow. If any of these things are going on, I have the same condition where normally I come back to the lungs with 75% of my oxygen, but now maybe I'm letting, I'm letting way more out. It has the effect of moving the whole curve to the right. You know, what that actually means is, you know, decreases affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen. And this is sometimes they call this the Bohr effect, this pH thing. Um, but this basic idea, it's kind of, cause you might ask yourself like, seems kind of idiotic. Why, why have little Joey blood drop coming back to the lungs, you know, holding on to most of its oxygen, you know, and it's going to be because it gives you this um, ability, like if you need to, you can dump way more oxygen into the tissue. So under these conditions, maybe like our little blood drop is actually gonna come back with very little oxygen left because it's given up a lot more, but that's not like at rest. That's happening when you've got these conditions that are happening during high metabolic activity. So th does that make sense? Yeah, yes. Can you just explain how the graph moves to the right? That's the only part I'm having a hard time with. Um, you know, if we say less affinity, so at any point, whatever the percentage here is, is gonna be a little lower, right? Wherever you are, it's kind of lower. And if you just connect the dots, it looks like the graph moved to the right. That's why I'm saying it's probably more intuitive to think about decreased affinity for oxygen. But what it looks like on a graph is this. Like if, if I have my yellow graph, which is further to the right at 40, I'm at 50%. My blue one, which is more to the left at 40, I'm at 75%. Oh yeah, now I get it, okay. Yeah, so 
people are, again, people often say it moves the graph to the right, but I think it's more intuitive to think decreases hemoglobin's affinity for oxygen. It makes it more, makes it easier for the, for the blood to let go of the oxygen and deliver it into the tissues under the same conditions. All right. Every, any other questions? This can be a little funny to think about, but it's kind of cool. Okay. Well, the time we're doing all right here. So basically we're gonna talk about pulmonary ventilation. Now, how you actually get the air in and out of your lungs. Then we'll literally spend three minutes talking about overall control of respiratory and then we'll be done. So again, this is kind of the bellows, moving the air in and out of your lungs. Um, for this to make sense, we need to do a little bit of physics and a little bit of anatomy, and then we'll just put it all together. Um, first, the physics. So if I have some gas. A gas you can think of as little particles zipping around and they're moving and whenever they hit the wall of whatever container they're in, they exert some force. And that is the pressure. So pressure is just the force of whenever the little gas molecules hit the wall of whatever container they're in. Um, if I take the same amount of gas, the same number of little dealy boppers in there, except now instead of having them in a little box, I have them in a big box, then they're going to spend a lot more time flying through the air and less time whacking against the walls. So there's going to be less overall pressure hitting against the walls. So what this means is if I look at pressure, it's going to be proportional to the inverse of the volume. There's an inverse relationship between pressure and volume here. So, so does that, that, that make sense? What is this? Is it, I think it's Boyle's law. So pressure and volume are inversely related and that's gonna be critical. Next, we need to do a little anatomy. I am, I can draw better than this when I'm not kind of stressed in a rush here. All right, so here we have the trachea coming down. And the lungs are obviously in the thoracic cavity. Put the lungs in here. I'm going to make the lungs more simple. They, they have multiple lobes, but I'm going to just make them with two, look, look like two things here. Um, what forms the lower boundary of the thoracic cavity, the division between the thoracic and the abdominal cavity? Diaphragm. The diaphragm. So here's my diaphragm which is um, important to realize when the diaphragm contracts, it will flatten out. If you think about this thing getting more taut, it will move down as it contracts. 
So when the diaphragm contracts, it's gonna increase the volume of the thoracic cavity. Um, then the other thing we need to do here is add in the pleura. Add, we need to add in the serous membrane. Remember we talked about, I talked about that double membrane with the slippery stuff in it. So there's gonna be two layers. There's gonna be one layer against the lungs. This we're gonna call the visceral pleura. Then there's gonna be another layer that is against the inner wall. The parietal pleura. And again, they are two layers with slippery fluid, so the lungs don't rub against the inside of the chest cavity. But super important, these, there is a suction in between. If you pull on one, the other one comes along for the ride. So that suction is critical. So that suction is going to be super important, basically because of this. The diaphragm can change the volume of the thoracic cavity, but then because of this suction, as we expand the thoracic cavity, it's gonna also pull the lungs and increase their volume. If you did not have that suction, you would just have the lungs sitting there doing whatever and just the chest getting bigger and smaller, but the lungs wouldn't change size. So the only reason the lungs can change size is because of this suction. So make sure, in fact, we're gonna talk about pneumothorax where you lose that suction and that's gonna give you a collapsed lung. So now we're set. Now we can talk about, in fact, maybe it's gonna be faster if I do my little typing tool here. So let me do this. You know, one, you know, the whole thing is going to start by the contraction of the diaphragm and other muscles. Um, the diaphragm is the main one that drives um, um, pulmonary ventilation, but you have other ones. Your abdominal muscles do it your scalenes, um, your, your back muscles, your um, pec minors. There's a lot of different things that can change the size of your thoracic cavity. But the diaphragm is the main one. And what did we say? What happens to the volume of the thoracic cavity when the diaphragm contracts? It increases. Increases. Yeah, so exactly. And now the next part is gonna be because of that suction, you know, due to that pleural suction, all right, so, the thing I wanna make sure people realize, no air has moved yet. This has not been about air coming in or out or anything. All we've done so far is changing the volume of the lungs. So now we have to think about what's happening to the pressure in the lungs as the volume goes up. Decreases. Decrease. Exactly. 
And so now we have the pressure in the lungs is lower than outside. And now which way does air move? It moves from high to low pressure. So now we have, you know, air flows So that is inspiration. That's how you inhale. Um, exhaling is kind of the opposite, although it's not as active. Basically to exhale, you're gonna relax the muscles. And if you relax the muscles, the thoracic cavity um, compresses. Volume decreases. Um, the lungs are now going to get smaller. Being remember, because of that compliance, they're being held open because of that suction when the thorax is at large volume. But if you bring the walls in, the lungs naturally want to get smaller. So then the lung volume decreases as well. And now what's going to happen to the pressure inside the lungs? It's going to go up. So pressure in lungs goes up. And so then our exhale is going to be, you know, air flows out along the pressure gradient. So this is usually passive. So inhaling, you have to like tense the muscles, increase the volume, lower the pressure, let the air come in. But for exhaling, typically in a quiet exhale, you just kind of relax and it just kind of happens. Um, so any questions about this? So one thing, this is called negative pressure breathing. You know, it's very different than blowing up a balloon. When you blow up a balloon, you're pushing air into the balloon, which increases the pressure, which makes the thing get bigger. This one, it's like, I promise you there'll be a question on your exam next Tuesday, talking, asking you to describe how this works. Um, you are going to lose points if you don't have the causality correct, right? You increase the volume then that decreases the pressure and only then does the air move. The air doesn't move. It's not because sometimes people think, oh, the air comes in and that's why the lungs get bigger. But it's not, it's the lungs get bigger, which creates a, a low pressure zone, which then causes the air to flow in. Um, what happens It's like, oh my God, he's been stabbed. Oof, blood, blood. What's gonna happen if there's a hole in the chest wall here? The lung will disinflate. Why is it that? Because it won't have the pleural right, pulled exactly. from yeah. the suction, yeah. Exactly, that section between the pleura is critical to have the lungs follow along with the thoracic wall. So if you break that vacuum here, air comes in, the lung will collapse. The lung will basically 
just get kind of small. We call it atelectasis or collapsed lung. Is there any way that that would be able to heal like on its own? Um, so, I mean, the way they do, and I should, let me give you the other word you should know is pneumothorax. Pneumothorax is if air gets into that space there. Yeah, so I mean, typically what they do is they patch up the hole and they drain the air out and restore the vacuum. Um, and because the two sides are independent, you can collapse one lung without collapsing the other lung, fortunately. Um, and I should mention for typical breathing, the diaphragm only moves like a centimeter or, or so, and there's a pressure difference of a few millimeters of mercury. Um, so for quiet breathing, it's pretty gentle, but you can obviously get much more dramatic. You can pull the diaphragm down 10 centimeters and have these huge pressure differences. To, <gasps> you know, if you want to do like major respiratory movements. Um, so any questions about this? Um, I mean, one of the things I tell people, it's, you know, really you want to pay attention that it's not inflating, like, because again, your intuition is more like balloons. Like a frog, a frog does what's called positive pressure breathing. It, it actually does gulp air to fill up its lungs. Like, <laughs> yeah, it, but that's not what you do. You like, you just have an open tube between the outside and your lungs. These muscles enlarge the volume, which lowers the pressure, and then the air rushes in. Okay, I could do it. I can use my abdominal muscles and change the volume of my stomach. <laughs> right? I can do that same negative pressure breathing with my, just bringing air down my esophagus into my stomach and do my cool burping trick, right? It's, but the basic idea is if you expand the volume, it creates a low pressure zone that causes the air to flow in. Um, all right, so the very last thing we're gonna do and just spend a couple of moments is kind of overall control of breathing. So there are respiratory centers in the pons and the medulla. Um, the main thing you need to know about control of breathing is that it is not driven by oxygen levels. So that feeling that I got to breathe, I'm running out of breath, is nothing to do with not having enough oxygen. It has to do with a buildup of CO2. So basically rising CO2 causes like, you know, urge to breathe. You know, what that means is if you are, in fact, somebody in grad school did this that I, that I knew to kind of test it, was sucking like just nitrogen. Took a nitrogen tank and was just breathing it in and out. If you are breathing just pure nitrogen in and out, what's gonna happen? <laughs> 
hypoxia? Yeah, basically, are you going to feel like like you're running out of oxygen though? So it's, you're going to get hypoxic. You're not going to have enough oxygen because you're not. There's no oxygen here. This is pure nitrogen. You're just going to pass out. Right, because what's happening, as long as you're ventilating in and out, the CO2 is not building up. You're outgassing CO2. So CO2 levels are not building up in your body. So you never feel there's anything wrong. But your brain at some point isn't getting any oxygen. And the guy actually just head planted on the tank, went bing. Um, but didn't realize it wasn't like there was this warning, like, oh, wait a second, I'm, I, I'm running out of oxygen. Because as long as you're breathing in and out and even in and out, and there's no CO2 buildup, there's no warning that you are, that you def you need to breathe. So that's, a, that's so it's important to, if supposedly people died, like there was people in the space program who walked into a room that was completely flooded with nitrogen and didn't realize anything was wrong until they just passed out and died in there. Um, so you need to just keep that in mind when you're thinking about control of breathing. It's driven by CO2. It's not driven by oxygen levels, which is again, a little counterintuitive. Um, there are some cases like in, um, with emphysema, like in emphysema, you have problems where, you know, you kind of lose, lose elasticity of the lung tissue and also actually um, kind of alveolar walls break down. So you have less surface area to, to um, to exchange. But what happens here, because the lungs aren't very elastic, you actually, instead of exhaling being passive, you have to work at it more. And it also means you tend to have higher than normal levels of CO2 just always around because you're not as efficient at, as exhaling. Supposedly people with emphyse chronic emphysema um, their system will actually recalibrate and um, have more of an oxygen, a hypoxic driven um, breathing control. Um, but that's not typical. Um, typically, um, you'll have, you know, your, you, hopefully everybody here in our Zoomlandia group here is having CO2 driven breathing. Um, and again, there's so much more we could talk about this. It's, it's frustrating given the timing, but I think in the in the interest of in the interest of getting through this stuff and not talking forever, I think I'm going to tie it off here. Let me double double check that there's nothing else that I desperately want to talk about. Um, we should mention, you know, rhinitis. What is rhinitis? Is that nasal congestion? Yeah, it's just inflammation of your nasal, nasal cavity. It's basically like a cold, right? The, the cold virus is called the rhinovirus because it gets up into your nasal, into your nose. Um, Pneumonia. Pneumonia is when you start getting like fluid buildup inside the little alveoli and, and, and your bronchioles and stuff. And it makes it harder for the air to come down and also a much, much longer distance for the oxygen to have to try to diffuse. So you're not as efficient at moving the oxygen into your blood. Um, so pneumonia is, is, is something that you don't want. I have a question. Uh-huh. What's a walking pneumonia? I think that's just when you're, you're still mobile. Oh. I, I'm pretty sure that's all it is. 
Oh, okay. As opposed to being bedridden or something. <laughs> but I, I can double check that. Um, you know, and there's lots of different things that can cause it, including COVID. Um, and one of the things that, that I, that in one of my clinical classes that I had never thought about, but the, um, because a lot of times you always think of old people kind of dying of pneumonia in the hospital or something. But they were saying like, you know, it's just something like when all your systems are breaking down, you know, and your immune system isn't working and just, you know, often this is what takes people out, but it's not necessarily, it's this virulent thing that kills old people. It's more like when everything's falling apart, it's one of the things that ultimately can be the final straw. Um, so, but anyway, so let's, so I'm going to say exam three up to here. Stop sign do not enter. So we are going to be covering new stuff on Thursday, but it's not on your exam. So when you're studying for your exam, it's just going to be cardiovascular and respiratory. Even though we are going to continue talking about the um, urinary system on Thursday. The urinary system will be on the final exam. It's not exam four. It's not going to be on this exam. So this gives you, you know, you have one week, you know all this stuff. Make sure you make sure you kind of study. All right. So let's take another little break and then we're going to get into some more respiratory, but from the lab point of view.